All right, welcome everyone to this month's Schreier Family Topics in Rehabilitation Science. Um, today's uh, Topics in Rehab Science will be presented by Dr. Masahiro Yamada, who is a postdoctoral research fellow uh, in my laboratory at um, MRRI. Um, Masa has a BS in kinesiology, um, BS and MS in kinesiology and a PhD in kinesiology from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, Dr. Uh, Yamada is very much interested in um, understanding the mechanisms and improving interventions to uh, augment force production in individuals with neurological deficits. And so his topic today is going to be um, low intensity strength training with blood flow restriction as a potential approach to improve force production of force generation after stroke. So Masa, take it away. All right. <clears throat> so let me share my slides. Can you guys see it okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Masahiro Yamada, and I would like to appreciate the opportunity to talk and also support from the Stryer family uh, for today's presentation. And for those who would like to receive a continuing education credit, the code is here and highlighted in 830NYX. 830NYX. I'm going to pause it for a couple more seconds. All right. So this is the slide for disclosure announcement that there's no financial relationship. So the today's presentation's topic is related to blood flow restriction and resistance training as part of rehabilitation in stroke patients. And I will like to talk two separate topics, blood flow restriction and resistance training, but my ultimate goal and at the end of the presentation today is a combination of these two as a part of motor rehabilitation in stroke patients. And <clears throat> my goal is to finish my talk within the next 35 minutes or so. And, and I would like to have your opinion, uh, comments, feedback, critique, compliments, or compliments. Uh, so, uh, so that's that's my plan. I'm not I'm not trying to use the entire time for the rest of the time. So here we go. So starting from my motivation, uh, why this research is important, and also uh, why we uh, why I became interested in this line of work is. The first uh, damage to the, the brain from stroke causes the motor impairments in the opposite side of the body because of the impaired uh, communication between the brain and muscle fibers. And this reduced excitability to the motor cortices in the hemisphere uh, not only affects the ability to produce force, but also the control of force production. And this muscular weakness in the strong, uh, stroke patients is really problematic, and, and it's really, a, really a big factor. It's actually the strongest, strongest predictor than dextrity, cognitive function, and a variety of assessments and measures, and which accounts for about 90% of the entire clinical assessment scores. So I've been studying human movements through the lenses of motor control, coordination, you know, getting better at moving. However, there is there's this big premise that before getting into this coordination and getting moving better, which is we have the ability to generate force and you know against the gravity and we can lift our arms. But one of the things about more, uh, stroke rehabilitation is that this big premise have we resolved these issues, you know, improving strength and recovering from weaknesses in stroke patients? The answer is we haven't. So that's how I became really interested in, you know, we have to be able to regain strength first before talking about this coordination and getting better at learning, relearning motor skills. So that's how we became really interested in uh, re resistance training as a part of rehabilitation. But, um, <clears throat> 
I would like to talk about why then resistance training is not the biggest part of rehabilitation in stroke. So <clears throat> to talk about that, I would like to overview and review quickly about the, the mechanism of force production and also uh, resistance training. So basically to generate force and to activate muscle fibers, we need a neural drive from the center of our system. And simply put, the greater that neural activation, greater the muscle act activation and therefore greater force generation. And this, the vast majority of this cortical neural drive <clears throat> comes from the contralateral hemisphere, the opposite side of the motor cortices, the brain, through the cortical spinal tract or CST. And as you can see in the number, the vast majority of this, the neural drives comes from this, the CST, which across, uh, which crosses at the medulla in the brainstem, which and uh, innervates the motor neuron pool in the spinal cord, and then activates alpha motor neuron and activate muscle fibers. But when we talk a little bit more specific to resistance training, and uh, which we vary intensity, exercise intensity, right? And as we increase the force generation intensity, like say 80% of your max, 80, 90% of the maximum force output, then we need more neural drive. In that case, we begin to uh, activate the motor cortices of the ipsilateral hemisphere or the same side of the body you you try to generate force so through the cortical ret reticular spinal tract or the crest so that's the basic uh like in a, si a simple form of like a, a force reduction mechanism and one of the reasons why a stroke patients have weakness in force generation is because this main pathway the excitability of this main pathway is attenuated and the key element of resistance training, or in other words, for resistance training to be effective, one of the biggest factors is high intensity training, which can be defined as 60 to 80% of your 1RM, or the, the RM, 1RM is the maximum force you can lift in one time, one repetition. So you do that for 60 to 80% of, uh, of your 1RM for multiple reps, multiple sets that's high intensity of just resistant training. The reason why it's high intensity is effective is that when we look at the muscle groups, let's say biceps muscles, we have different types of fibers and these different types of fibers are recruited by different types of motor neurons. And different motor neurons have different thresholds, meaning some motor neurons are easier to fire and contract the muscles and other motor neurons have higher threshold. So if you want to activate as many muscle fibers as possible during training, we want higher intensity. So that's why high intensity training is more effective than lower intensity training. So when you think about this resistance training from this neural ass perspectives, we can kind of see that the resistance training alone can be a really good candidate of motor rehabilitation from stroke and indeed, uh, resistance training can cause adaptation, neuroplasticity at the cortical level. So resistance training can be really good, uh, good mode of rehabilitation. But again, resistance training is not the biggest portion of motor re rehab. And one of the reason is because first, high intensity training is too demanding for clinical clinical population. It's not only specific to stroke patients, but generally speaking, frail individuals, clinical population, high intensity resistant training is too demanding sometimes. But more specific to stroke patients, high intensity force generation can cause abnormal movement patterns. So for example, when you, as you can see in the picture, so uh, let's say you want to reach forward then this movement requires, of course, force generation against the gravity and also against uh, and above the weight of your arm. And this movement requires shoulder flexion and elbow extension, which uh, so within the same arm, different segments requires uh, required to do a different mode of contraction. You know, one is flexing, the other one is extending. But in some stroke patients develop this abnormal movement patterns that they cannot individually contract uh, muscles different ways. Instead, they contract the entire limb in a flexed pattern 
or extending pattern. As you can see in this picture, so shoulder flexion is associated with elbow flexion instead of extension. So that's abnormal movement patterns. And one of the reasons is because the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the neural drive from this main pathway is attenuated because of the stroke. And as a compensation, we kind of borrow more neural drive from this the crest. And the stroke patients who develop this abnormal movement pattern has this hyper excitability in this crest. And some researchers believe that this is the cause of this abnormal, abnormal movement patterns. And to illustrate more about why this can be a problematic in resistant training is uh, shown in this uh, research I want to introduce. So in this research, uh, stroke patients sat in this chair and, and there is a 3D motion capture system, the special camera tracked in their arms and which was display, displayed in the monitor in front of them. And the goal of the task was to move as like large space as possible. In other words, to draw a, as bigger, a big, bigger circle as possible. So that's the task. And as also, you can see that there's a special device that supports the uh, stroke patient's arm. So in one condition, the entire weight of the patient's arm was supported. So there's no force requirement when, you, when they do this task. In another condition, uh, they reduced this support. So they had to generate a little more force. And in another condition, they further reduced the support and no support. And in, this, in addition to that, they pulled their arm. So they had to generate more and more force. So that here's the results of this task. So what they found was as the force generation requirement increases and the movement space they can move their arm reduced. This is because they can individuate the elbow extension, right? So the more the elbow is more flex flex with, with the shoulder flexion, limiting their movement space. So that's what you see um, in the figure over here. So obviously this is a problematic in activities of daily living, but when we talk about resistant training, if they cannot move their arm throughout the range of motion, we cannot do the resistant training. So resistant training can be a good a candidate of rehab and especially high intensity, but this can lead to abnormal, abnormal movement patterns. So what would be, what, what can we do? And one way is to do a lower intensity resistance training. But as I mentioned earlier, this is less effective than high intensity training. So the biggest question that we're pursuing is that, is there any approach to maximize the effectiveness of resistance training while minimizing abnormal movement patterns? So that's where BFR or blood flow restriction kicks in. So BFR, also known as Kaatsu training, is originally discovered in Japan and developed in summer in 1980s. And we use the, this blood flow, uh, blood flow cuff. And so historically people have used the, like a bl uh, blood pressure cuff or the surgical tourniquet. And more you know, recently people use like a specialized cuff just for BFR. And you wrap those cuff around the most proximal portion, the closest to the trunk portion of their arm or you know, the arm or leg. And how you use it is the BFR alone or BFR with the resistance training or BFR with the aerobic exercise. I'm gonna focus on BFR with the resistance training today. And to picture, to visualize how the BFR session will go, you inflate the cuff to restrict the blood flow, not to occlude the blood, cup, uh, blood flow. And under this environment, you conduct low intensity training, which is 20 to 30% of one RM. So one fifth of your maximum, and you conduct that multiple sets. After the session, you deflate the cuff, and the content of the session varies a lot uh, in the previous literature. But the most popular one is four sets of thirty reps 
15, 15, 15, with 30 seconds to 60, 45 seconds rest in between sets. And the duration of the entire session is about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how efficient you, you know, can calculate blood, uh, blood pressure and so on. But the actual contraction time is about six to seven minutes. And here is the sentence that the most important among, across the entire presentation today. So the BFR, people have found that the BFR with low intensity resistance training was, has been shown to be as effective as high intensity training, or at the minimum, promotes better hypertrophic strength gain than the same intensity without BFR. And to give you an idea, a more concrete idea, I want you to, to visualize the, you go to go into the gym, generic gym, not like, you know, gold gym or sports performance gym, but like, you know, generic fitness gym and pick up the heaviest plate which is usually 45 pounds. You put that on both sides of the barbell and barbell is about 45 pounds. So this is 135 pounds. Or depending on the individual, you can say it's, it's light or heavy, but let's say this is high intensity, right? So 20% of that is only 27 pounds, which is about the, the weight of the 30 packs, you know, packs of beer. And so that's the difference between high intensity versus low intensity. And if you talk to personal trainer that who don't know about VFR and you say 27 pounds, I lift 27 pounds of beer keg and then I, I can get the same amount of benefits from the 135 pounds training. And they will think you're delusional or if it's literature, you know, it, it could be typo or something. So the researchers continue, you know, you know, let's look at, let, let me try and then continue to replicate the benefits of BFR and over and over again, that kind of spread through the researchers who do the, you know, the research on clinical populations. And that's how the BFR training got kind of exploded in the in previous couple of uh, previous years and two or three years um, in a clinical population. Uh, so that's the story of BFR in the research area. So to reiterate my point in this presentation, um, if the effect is the same as high intensity training, why do we have to do BFR? And I think this question is legitimate uh, if you're talking about neurotypical healthy individuals. But in terms of clinical populations, again, BFR is usually done with low intensity, which is low mechanical stress on the musculature, connective tissues, and bone tissues, which can be potentially safer. Specific to stroke patients, this low intensity can reduce the move of normal movement patterns in stroke patients. So BFR with low intensity training can potentially fight against this weakness in stroke patients. But this improvement in muscular strength and of muscular strength can be coming from the physiological level, neurological level, or a combination of both. So I would like to briefly talk about why BFR uh, works. Um, and the 99% of the literature is coming from the physiology. So we, uh, we only have a hypothesis uh, from the physiological perspective. So I'm gonna briefly talk about that. Um, so when you conduct the resistant training without BFR, the traditional resistant training, there is this mechanical stress and also the chemical stress, right? The, the accumulation of metabolites because of usage of uh, the energy. And these um, informations are sent to sensory, uh, sensory nerves and in effect to the central nervous system. And then you will have a, a you know, arterial flow difference. You, there's gonna be more blood flow to the working muscle you increase the heart rate, blood pressure, and greater endocrine responses like growth hormone, IGF-1, and cortisol, and so on. And you, you continue to do that consistently, regularly, and then you go through hypertrophy because of the greater uh, protein synthesis signal impact, uh, signaling stimulation, and also improve neural efficiency, and therefore you improve muscular strength. And you can imagine that if you if you do a higher intensity, there's gonna be greater me mechanical and chemical stress. So there's gonna be greater response. So that's why, uh, that's another reason why higher intensity is more effective than lower intensity from the physiological perspectives. 
So what happens with BFR training? So with BFR, you basically restrict the blood flow. You don't occlude the arterial flow. But when you do that, you almost or completely shuts down the venous return. So you effectively traps the metabolites uh, within and surrounding the muscle tissues that you're working on. So when you do that, so this amount of metabolites are accumulated in the tissues only when you do the high intensity training. So what BFR really does is really deceiving this sensory information. Your body feels like as if you're going through high intensity training. Indeed, in reality, you just lift in lighter weights. So therefore, the, there is going to be greater response as if you're going through a high intensity training. So for example, in this figure, the y-axis is the growth hormone secretion uh, concentration, and the x-axis is the time and pre-post exercise and the follow-up. And the black trace is, is the blood flow restriction uh, with low intensity, and the white traces are the control, which is the same intensity, the same protocol without VFR. And also there is going to be a greater uh, muscle activities and also a preferential uh, activation of fast twitch fibers, which is generally speaking um, activated only when you do a high intensity training. So for this uh, figure, uh, X axis is the EMG activity and Y axis is the, the popular training that I mentioned earlier. Um, the 30 repetitions, 15, 15, 15. So the EMG activity during the BFR training. And the black traces are two different protocols of BFR, and the white traces are, again, uh, the control, the low intensity without BFR. So because the responses are just like high intensity training, there's going to be greater protein synthesis signaling, greater hypertrophic events, and therefore greater strength gain uh, compared to lower intensity without BFR. So that's kind of the mechanism of BFR. But the information that I have presented so far is just the individuals, neurotypical healthy individuals. But our focus is, and our interest is the clinical population. Starting from the conclusion, the BFR has been also shown to be beneficial in clinical populations and also frail individuals. And I'm just going to um, present the, the systematic um, uh, now, our meta analysis, but patient, it has been shown to be effective in patients with kidney disease, hypertension, uh, musculoskeletal disease, or in many reviews in older adults. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data on individuals with neurological impairments, but we have some like a small scale pilot study or case studies. So I would like to introduce a little bit of uh, some of them. So this study, children with a cerebral palsy, and 10 of them conducted BFR with manual resistance therapy. And the other group just did the manual resistance training. And after five weeks, the BFR group increased the muscle thickness um, in, to a greater degree than the manual resistance uh, group. And this is a case study. An individual with Parkinson's disease patient went through uh, six weeks of BFR training, and they uh, they did the low, uh, low, uh, lower leg uh, exercise, and they improved the strength. And after six weeks, and also functional assessment like gait speed, and there's no adverse events reported. And this one is a feasibility study that 15 individuals with uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, went through high intensity training and BFR training on separate two separate occasions. Basically, they did not find difference in the pain scale, subjective pain scale, or soreness, um, and, but they found the differences in a greater perceived exertion with high intensity training, which can be on potentially additional benefit of conducting BFR with uh, in people in neurological impairments because if you can expect the same effect, but less ex subjective exertion and BFR, that may be uh, the benefit, benefit. And this systematic review uh, just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, so they were able to identify seven studies. And although these seven studies included a mixture of BFR with the resistance training, aerobic exercise, but 
they found that the six out of seven studies had the positive effect with the BFR. And there are other small case studies in stroke patients on, or spinal cord injuries. So it seems like the BFR so far with the low intensity training uh, is also effective in individuals with neurological impairments. Um, but the vast majority of the, the evidence we have is those muscle thickness or like, you know, the EMG activities related to more neurophysiological and uh, neuromuscular activities. So how about the, can we actually improve the neural processes? Unfortunately, we don't really know about the neural adaptations in B, uh, using BFR. Uh, going back to the findings from the neurotypical individuals, uh, in terms of EMG activity, neural, neuromuscular activities, uh, research have shown that the BFR with low intensity increases muscular activity after four to 12 weeks of training. Um, relative to the same intensity without BFR. So there might be some neural adaptation going on at the neuromuscular level, spinal level, or cortical level, or the combination of some. In terms of cortical activity from the contralateral motor cortices, this CST, uh, the cortical spinal tract, the main uh, pathway, and the, the findings are actually mixed. There are uh, three studies I have identified that the increase in the cortical activity in the, the motor cortices on during or right after the B, BFR training. The other three experiments I, I have identified, uh, they didn't see any change right after the BFR protocol. And in terms of cortical uh, activities from the ipsilateral, from the pros, uh, crest, uh, the pathway. Um, nobody has done it, so we don't know uh, about the effect of neural adaptation from this perspective. So given these unknown factors and limitations on what we are trying to do in the future with BFR in stroke patients is really try to understand if we can reduce the activity from the crest, which potentially can reduce abnormal movement patterns. And also another question, uh, as you saw in the mixed you know, results, can we actually change the neural uh, contribution from the, the residual, the spinal, uh, cortical spinal tract? And that's another question that we try to answer. And also, if there is a neural adaptation, and what is the timeline of that? So we were trying to uh, conduct case studies of like eight to 10 weeks of training and measure these factors um, every two weeks to see that the longitudinal, to get the longitudinal data. And so that's where we are uh, right now. And I would like to finish my presentation uh, with uh, the safety issues. So in terms of uh, risks and safety and in BFR with low intensity, training, there are two sources of potential risks. One, risk is associated with resistant training, and the other one is risk associated with BFR. And some researchers are, have raised concerns about three different sources of uh, potential risks uh, associated with the BFR. One is reperfusion injury. Another one is rhabdomyolysis, which is muscle cell damage, and also the deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism from the occlusion of the blood flow. Um, this is my opinion. This is not like any consensus among the, the entire research community, but I think the BFR can be com uh, completed safely uh, with proper education of clinicians and also proper risk assessment on excluding the most vulnerable ones. Uh, and the reason why I say this is uh, one, um, there is in 2000, 2006, there's a large scale surveys conducted in clinicians and they found that more than 12,000 VFR sessions conducted and the patients were, you know, the healthy population, athletes, and also clinical population, including hypertensive, diabetic, stroke patients, and heart disease, and so on, or cardiovascular disease. And among all these sessions, uh, they identified three serious adverse events. 
And all of these serious uh, uh, adverse events happened outside the hospital settings. And 10 years later, the even larger scale survey was conducted uh, um, and responses were obtained from more than 200 facilities in Japan. And um, among the BFR sessions, and the, more than 10% of the clients were stroke patients, and there was no serious adverse events reported. And that's and potentially um, there might be an improvement in the education of clinicians. And that's another, and that's why I said that proper education of clinicians may be an important factor. But these two surveys were conducted in Japan. And as I mentioned earlier, BFR, BFR was discovered many, many years ago. And there's a long history of BFR in Japan. So this might be just something unique to, you know, to, to Japan. So uh, this, uh, another study that came out a couple of months ago was that conducted a physical therapist, physical therapist assistant who have done, uh, who have, uh, who've been doing rehabilitation. Um, and I think it was in the United States and they answered 38% of them reported using BFR in patients with neurological condition at least once and they did not report any adverse events. And also, as I, as I introduced earlier, there are literature reviews and meta-analysis uh, conducted in clinical populations with little adverse events reported. So if we collect all of them, the incident rate of the adverse events, serious adverse events, is, is lower than resistant training itself, or like you know, if like running or you know, interval training, or similar to uh, adverse events have been reported from exercise. But one thing I would like to uh, emphasize is that uh, adverse events, serious adverse events, have been reported before. So. Um, we should be careful about this because we don't know the exact mechanism why these events happened, or we don't know exact mechanism of BFR. But if you know these adverse events, these risks of BFR is act actually really true, it's reasonable to think that the clinical population will have higher ratio of adverse events. But that's not what we see. And there's a mixture of people who reported adverse events and they are you know, seemingly healthy individuals, active, no uh, clinical conditions per se. So, so that's why I believe that these adverse events are, are something independent of BFR. But either way, again, we don't know the exact reason. We don't know the exact evidence. So we should take conservative steps. So some of the 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 uh, caution we should care when it comes to the protocol of BFR, the duration of blood flow constriction should be um, as minimal as possible. In healthy individuals, sometimes people have done 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but we should, minimize, we should limit like 10, 15 minutes. And so far, the pressure cuff, the pressure cuff is recommended to 40 to 80% of arterial flow occlusion for healthy individuals, but we should take more conservative pressure, allowing more blood flow to go to the muscles. And there are different protocols of BFR. For example, continuous BFR means uh, you uh, inflate the cuff and leave it the, in an entire session, whereas the intermittent BFR is you deflate the cuff occasionally. And um, this research group and actually recommended in the clinical population that if when you do more than four sets of BFR sessions, you know, deflate the cuff every two sets. And I think which I think that uh, suggestion is reasonable for a clinical population. And also we should take consider about the risk factors of rhabdomyolysis. Um, how do you uh, consider them as uh, risk factors and when you do a uh, BFR training, it really depends on your experience and your comfortable level. For example, I know that uh, BFR has been done in kidney disease patients and safely multiple times, more than 100 patients. But I would I, I take that kidney disease as a contraindication uh, because when 
if you have rhabdomyolysis and kidney disease patients have a higher risk of getting a life-threatening situation from rhabdomyolysis, and therefore, I don't feel comfortable. So whether you consider that as caution or contraindication, uh, we don't really have the specific borderline. Then in terms of thrombosis, and again, we should consider about the risk factors of thrombosis. Um, but again, the, there is no actual evidence to, to, uh, to support that the BFR actually increases the risk of thrombosis. And actually, uh, uh, multiple people have measured the biomarkers of thrombosis, and the BFR actually has never really shown to increase those biomarkers. So, but the risk is there. So in summary, BFR with low intensity training can be as effective as high intensity resistant training and can be subjectively less challenging and can uh, limit abnormal movement patterns of stroke patients. And BFR training can be, uh, has been completed safely in frail clinical populations, including patients with neurological impairments, but risk should not be ignored. So right now we should take more stringent uh, criteria and should be used with the support or supervision of healthcare professionals. So that's all I have. Are you ready for uh, questions, comments, anything, Dr. Yamada here? John. Um, thanks. Um, nice talk, Masa. Um, you know, I think the the um, method you're talking about is very interesting from a mechanistic perspective, but I want to kind of pursue the translational side a little bit because, I mean, it seems like we already know that exercise of some kind is extremely beneficial. So the question is, what kind of exercise is right. the best? And you, you listed really three reasons that this might be a step forward. One is the effortfulness. But I, I think the only data you presented on that was that quite small study where people subjectively perceived it less effortful. But given that the that the biggest problem we have with exercise is non-compliance, it seems to me that knowing that people are more willing to do this exercise and keep doing this exercise would be a key data element to focus on sooner rather than later. The second thing you focused on was abnormal activity. And while it's clear that during effortful contractions, one makes abnormal movements. What, what I'm not clear on is whether that translates into a greater likelihood of continuing to make abnormal movements or making them worse later on. I mean, when I lift a heavy weight, I grimace. <laughs> that doesn't mean I go around the rest of my day grimacing because I did that. So, so I don't think I don't think it's a big problem. People make abnormal movements during their effortful contraction. The question is, does it affect their pattern of uh, motor activation at other times? And then the last thing had to do with sort of the risks. And, and certainly the technique doesn't seem risky, but the, the question that seems more relevant is, does this open up exercise to people for whom high intensity exercise would be contraindicated? Right? Can can frail people who are too frail to do one thing do this instead? But that depends on questions like: uh, Does the heart rate response to this kind of is the heart rate response to this kind of exercise less intense than to uh, high intensity? Is the probability of coronary artery uh, um, uh, you know angina onset less with this and so on and so forth? And I don't know how those sort of physiologic stress indicators track uh, load versus <laughs> sense of effort or, you know, whatever the other things are. So anyway, th those are the three things that came to me. Thank you. Yeah, That's a, I think it's a great suggestion to that. Yeah, so we don't really know if the, you know, continuous movements, uh, that continue, uh, you know, having them to like a reducing the abnormal movement patterns is going to be actually, you know, recover from the correct the movements. But uh, I think it opens up the opportunity for those who were who, those who have been excluded from uh, resistant training. Because if you have a really high abnormal movement patterns, then they can't move their arms. 
and those those people have been uh, you know historically uh, traditionally excluded because they can't move their arm, they can't do the exercise. So I think in that perspective, that can open up a new opportunity for this type of severe patients. But yeah, again, yeah, your point is, uh, yeah, I don't have answers to that. And in terms of the, the physiological responses, uh, it seems like the, the blood flow restriction have a normal response to like, you know, somewhere between high intensity training and, and, you know, moderate intensity training, but it's not like, you know, the exaggerated, like, you know, beyond the high intensity training. And what's really interesting is that the, the benefits of BFR, like that's the, this is one, one of the reasons why we don't know a lot about BFR is that the, those cardiovascular adaptation is, has been shown to be actually better than like traditional cardio exercise or resistance training. You, uh, and that's why people have actually in a clinical population in, in terms of research, people have used BFR more with cardio exercise like walking than resistance training because of the, the benefits is some like unbelievable. So yeah. Uh, Dr. Yamada, can you hear me? It's Beverly Larkin. Yes, I can hear you. So uh, on an excellent presentation and fascinating work and premise, um, from a practical standpoint, uh, my husband, Sean, suffered a hemorrhagic stroke on the right side uh, in 2020, but he was a half marathon runner. And so he's back in the gym now. And so he's working twice a week and he does a lot of things. So his left side weakness for the arm and the leg is in a brace, but he's made tremendous progress largely due, I think, to the muscle strength and, you know, continuing PT and OT over the last two and a half years. So on a practical basis, where do we go from here? I mean, it sounds like an interesting premise for someone like Sean, who's already into exercise and does it religiously every day, not only walking every day, but in the gym two or three times a week. So any thoughts on where we would go from, from this point? Uh, the theory is fascinating. Um, good question. Again, um, I think if we are able to establish safety in BFR, I think there are a lot of a, opportunities. For example, um, you know, we don't have data, but uh, BFR has been, for example, used in athletic population, for example, bodybuilders right. um, who have hit the ceiling because in, 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 the, in the years of in the years of training, they can't improve anymore, right? right. And but the BFR augments it kind of adds some additional like you know stress to the right. to the body. So in that case, and you know, after a stroke, for example, you continue rehabilitation processes and in, in weeks and months and years. And at some point you feel not improving, but maybe incapable or a difficult to in increase the intensity anymore. And I think in that case, the BFR can you know, break this, uh, you know, ceiling and then continue to improve. So I think that's one way uh, we can see in terms of the future trajectory. And but to do that, we, we need we need to establish uh, safety. And, of course. Yeah. And, and we also need to, and we also, I'm just going to interject here, and we also need more research in terms of what are, how effective it is. Yeah. Because currently we are, you know, we are thinking that it might be effective based on these uh, studies in healthy individuals. Um, these studies yeah. have also been done, being done in older adults, um, and these really small scale studies in patients with uh, stroke or other neurological deficits. I need, I think, we need much more data in terms of its effective. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it, of how effective it is. Yeah, yeah, no, understood. Both Sean and I have a strong background in international clinical trial development, so totally understand that piece. But fascinating research, and you can actually see the potential benefits, and particularly if you're looking for patients in participation and small-scale kinds of studies in order to do, you know, those kind of safety and efficacy kinds of trials. So fascinating work. Thank you. Yes, thank you.
So Masa, I have always asked you this, but I'm going to kind of ask you this again because um, I think it will be of benefit to others as well who are thinking in, in, in along those directions. Um, so, so if you has have there been any studies in terms of a longitudinal change in strength? So, what's the time course of improvement in strength with BFR and um, low intensity training? Um, and does that change or does that time force tell us anything about um, these preponderance of musculoskeletal or metabolic changes versus neurophysiological changes and what what might be happening there? Uh, very difficult question to answer because uh, one, so just looking at the outcome of like a strength gain, right? And then the neural in neural uh, in individuals with neurological impairments, we see the effects uh, as soon as four to five weeks. So I think that's the expected timeline uh, to begin to see the effects. And but that's also the timing that the you know physiological adaptation occurs too. So that's why the big question is that I think it kind of resonates to John. One of the things that John uh, mentioned that. You know, can we actually improve the neural processes? You know, we know that for sure. BFR can improve, can cause hypertrophic event in the neural, you know, muscle fiber. You know, in the local, you know, environment, we can improve that. But can we actually improve neural processes? Especially, can we actually improve the, you know, the the stroke patients from that? I I have no specific answers. Another another thing that's really difficult to answer this is, you know, there are so many parameters uh, when it comes to resistance training, like the rest interval, number of sets, number of repetitions, frequency, not how many sessions you do, and what exercise you do, and also the mode of contraction. Are you doing concentric, eccentric contraction? Are you doing the isometric contraction you're doing isokinetic contraction and that changes the whole story and then and also the population and a lot of people um, mix up with the uh, adaptation the neural adaptation which probably the first few weeks of adaptation is not from the you know physiological adaptation it's more like a neural adaptation and the four weeks mostly neural adaptation, but some physiological adaptation, eight weeks combination of both. But if we mix all the findings of different duration, then we are mixing all the different mechanisms. So for that, we don't know. And the BFR itself has a lot of parameters. For example, the, the pressure changes the effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And the cuff size actually changes mm -hmm. the effectiveness. So there are a lot of things we need to get together and, hey, let's do this <laughs> instead of letting like, you know, everyone <laughs> do their own ways. So that's one thing we really have to uh, work on. But yeah, this big question is, can we actually improve neural process? Yeah, that's the, I think, the most important questions to pursue. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Masa, for that presentation. And hopefully you'll be able to give us some answers.